are ready to begin our study portion for today's broadcast. And actually, uh, and about actually tomorrow night, uh, we are anticipating having a, a new moon broadcast. And a uh, new moon broadcast is a um, monthly broadcast that we do. And we gather new moon reports, uh, take phone calls, Skype calls for praise and worship, and discuss the various events that occurred during the that particular month and um, in the scriptures, all the six month events we're going to discuss tomorrow night uh, during our new, broadcast, uh, our new moon broadcast. And, uh, and then a month from there will be our seventh new moon. And the seventh new moon uh, is none other than the Feast of Trumpets. So we are approximately a month away from the beginning of the fall feast season. So be ready for that. And uh, notice here the shape of the new moon is as so. And then we have the shape of the shofar, which is the same kind of shape. And I found that to be quite interesting that the two kind of share their the same shape. And, um, and we're going to be talking more about that uh, as we talk about the Feast of Trumpets today and the return of Yahshua the Messiah, Yahshua HaMashiach, Yahshua the Anointed One, Yahshua, the son of Elohim, our Redeemer, our Savior, our King, who was exalted very high and lifted up after a very humble beginning. And we do not know whether tomorrow will take place for us. And um, a lot of people talk about, well, Yahshua's return, his, his return is not going to be quite yet, or when will it be? If we knew that Yahshua the Messiah was going to return tomorrow, would there be any change in our behavior? Would we do anything differently if he was to return tomorrow? That's an important question that we all, you know, have to answer for ourselves. And um, tomorrow is not guaranteed. And so if we are not living in such a way that we would be accepted by him if he returned tomorrow, then we are walking a very dangerous line. And so our goal is that we would all be ready and prepared because, behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And uh, in this event, we can look at and say, we have hope now that really death is not the end of man. We have a future. Uh, and that death is a gateway into another time uh, called eternity. But at the last trump, this trumpet will sound. We, shall, we all look forward to that change. All who are in Messiah will be changed. We will all look forward to that change and the former things will pass away. The corruptible body will pass away and the incorruptible will be put on. He will make all things new. And we have an awesome future ahead of us. Well, this Feast of Trumpets, which is the first day of the seventh month of Yahweh's calendar, um, Yahweh never just comes right out and explains what this feast is really all about. He just says, on the seventh month, first of the month, you're going to go and get your trumpets out, your shofars, and you're going to blow the shofar, or he says you can also uh, shout, because the, the word teruah means shout also. 
Uh, they both make a very similar sound. <laughs> uh, and so, anyway, Leviticus 23, 24 says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. And, uh, and so in one month from tomorrow, and I'm not talking about the month that's on your calendar on the wall, most of you, the Roman calendar, one biblical month from tomorrow, tomorrow night, we are looking forward to this particular day called the first day of the month, the seventh month, and we shall have a Sabbath rest. It's a day of rest. Uh, we don't do any work. We treat it like a normal Sabbath day, with the exception that during the feast day Sabbaths, um, there is a permitted kind of work for you know preparing your food and so on. And so it is a feast. We are permitted to cook our food on that day. So it's a memorial, though. A memorial of blowing of trumpets. A holy convocation. A memorial of what? It's interesting. This blowing of trumpets is a memorial. A memorial is usually something that takes place in the past. Well, what's it memorializing? He never really comes out and says exactly what it's memorializing. Um, but they may have understood, some of them, what it was supposed to be memorializing, just looking at what happened. We're going to get into that in a minute. But... The very definition of this word um, that is called, it's translated blowing of trumpets. What is that all about? Well, we're going to dig into that. But what is, the, what is the purpose of the trumpets? When we look in scripture, what is the purpose of the trumpets? Well, we see in Numbers chapter, uh, well, we look at Numbers 29 first, actually. Numbers 29, verse 1 says, The seventh month, on the first day of the month, you have, shall have a holy convocation. You should do no customary work, that's work minus, except, you know, with exception of food being prepared. For if to you is a day, you for you is a day of blowing of the trumpets. Well, Numbers chapter 10, verse 1 says, Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the congregation and for directing the movement of the camps. When they blow both of them, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. But if they blow only one, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel, shall gather to you. But when you, when you sound the advance, the camps that lie on the east side shall begin their journey. So there's one long blast, one blast, and then there's this sound the advance. Interesting. Sound the advance. See, there is a uh, different kinds of sounds that could come from a trumpet. With one trumpet, that's one blast, the princes, which are the heads of the thousands of Israel, they would gather themselves. And if they blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part would go forward so there's two different kinds of sounds. Now, I'm not an expert shofar player, but I think I'm going to go ahead, as I do every year, get out the old shofar and show you um, perhaps what may have been the differences between the two sounds. And, uh, and so we can understand that there are different kinds of shofar blasts because scripture does talk about sounding the advance and then sounding only one, indicating that the advance would be more than one. And actually the word that's translated advanced is a word that means, um, is actually in the Hebrew, it's Torah, teruah, same word that we have translated for trumpets and blowing of trumpets. Feast of Trumpets. So here is the sound of one trumpet with one long blast. I'm going to try it <laughs> and uh, see what kind of sound I can get out of this thing. And by the way, if you're wanting to get yourself a horn, Feast of Tabernacles this year, one of the things that we are planning 
is we are planning to get, um, you know, have a shofar class. And if you join a shofar class, um, you can get yourself a shofar. Uh, and we actually take raw kudu horns and sand them down, drill the mouthpiece, and, uh, and teach you how to blow them. So anyway, here's the long blast. All right, and then we have the alarm, which it must be more than one blast. Uh, and what is traditional in Judaism, where well, there would be seven short blasts, it is kind of an alarming sound. So we have this alarming kind of a sound to it. So um, when they heard this terua, this advance, um, then they knew what that meant and what they were supposed to do. So it says, when you sound the advance the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall begin their journey. They shall sound the call for them to begin their journeys. And when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow, but not sound the advance. Sons of Aaron, the priests shall blow the trumpets, and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And then it says, when you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you will be remembered before Yahweh, your mighty one. You will be saved from your enemies. So these trumpets had an important use. Yahweh directed them to use these trumpets. And of course, these were the two silver trumpets that were uh, used in uh, by the priests. And they were not necessarily, you know, they were made of silver. They weren't made with, you know, the, the, the horn of a, of a ram or anything like that. These were the silver trumpets. But the priest would blow these trumpets. And it says to sound an alarm with these trumpets. And when they did so, Yahweh would deliver them from their enemies. I've kind of wondered sometimes, you know, whenever you need Yahweh's work, you know, to fight for you. Maybe, uh, I don't know, time of temptation or time of where you need his victory over the enemy in some, some area of your life you're being attacked. What might happen if you got the old shofars out and just started blasting these things? The alarm sounds. Um, because we know that, that even back then, the battle was Yahweh's, and the battle was actually a spiritual battle. It wasn't a physical, I mean, there's physical things involved, but the battle was spiritual. And we face, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and things in high places and so on. What might happen if we, in our camps, in our days, in our, the places where we dwell, if we might sound these trumpets if we might get some victory. So putting the shofar back up there on the shelf. Um, and it says also in the day of your gladness. When you have a, a moment of joy, get the old shofars out and start blasting them in your appointed feasts and at the beginning of your months. You shall blow the trumpets over over your burnt offerings, over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be a memorial before you, for you before your Elohim. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. So there may be some spiritual significance to these things that most in traditional Christianity have not really come to appreciate yet. So, you know, why not do this? 
It's not going to cause any harm, obviously. It's going to, it's something that Yahweh must see as significant in his eyes. And so imagine this would be a, this would be a normal sound they would hear in in Israel at the temple service, especially during the feast. They'd be hearing this sound all the time because these things these trumpets were blown over all the offerings. Uh, and so whenever there was an offering done, trumpets would be used. And, um, and maybe that's why, you know, even during our Feast of Tabernacles that we host here in Missouri, along with our uh, praises to Yahweh, we have people who bring shofars. And um, now you have to be kind of nice about the person in front of you. <laughs> And don't blast the horn into their ears. Um, but, you know, we do like to um, use these shofars, uh, maybe kind of stand away from the crowd a little bit and find a spot in the back to blow them. But, uh, you know, over the offerings, because these are spiritual offerings, offerings, the praise of our lips. And um, and so, and at the beginning of our months. And so, this is uh, when we keep track of Yahweh's calendar. This is something that we like to do as part of our new moon broadcast. Um, so now, many believe, as I do, that this feast is symbolic of the time of Yahshua's return and our own advance toward the promised land. When he will move us, right? We will meet him in the air. He will move us and we will gather to him from the east, the west, the north, and the south. And so it's a sim, it's, there's a lot of symbolism here and significance to this feast. And it says in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Master himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of Elohim, and the dead in Messiah will rise first. Then we who are alive will re and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Master in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Master. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Messiah will descend from heaven with a shout. And did you know the Hebrew word translated trumpets also carries the meaning of shouting? Because here we have blowing of trumpets. It's from 8643. And 8643 in the Hebrew, Teruah, uh, means alarm, signal, sound of tempest, shout, shout or blast of war, alarm or joy, alarm of war, war cry, battle cry, blast, shout of joy. And look, it's actually translated shout 11 times. 11 times it's translated shout. And so it does carry that meaning, that shout of an archangel. And when we shout out, we're crying out to Yahweh, deliver us from our enemies. And so along with our trumpet blowing, when we give praise to Yahweh, we, we, you might hear a lot of shouting at the Feast of Tabernacles in, in Missouri. And there's significance to this. Also, Notice in Joshua chapter 6, in verse 1 through 3, is walls of Jericho that came tumbling down. You hear about this. Uh, it says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, and none came in. And Yahweh said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And these were actually the ram's horns. They weren't the silver trumpets. Um... But the seventh day, I should probably check the Hebrew on that. Let me take a quick look at that before I make that assertion. Seven trumpets, that's shofar of, um, yes, it is a ram's horn in the Hebrew, yovel. 
Interesting word. Anyway, it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you shall when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. And so they were to shout, and that Hebrew word for shout is the Hebrew word called teruah, from which we get Yom Teruah, or Feast of Trumpets. And the wall of the city will fall down flat. And they came to, so they came to pass, back, it goes down to verse 15, 16, on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, Teruah, for Yahweh has given you the city. And, of course, we know the story that the walls came tumbling down, right? And there's this, now there's a striking parallel here between Joshua leading Israel into the promised land and giving them victory over their enemies. Um, you may not know this, but the word Jericho is actually pronounced Jericho, and, or, and the word actually means it's moon. That's what the word from Yerak, Yerak, in Hebrew means it's moon or moon. Now, when Moshe led the children of Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness, of course he spent a lot of time teaching the people his Torah, his law. But we know that not even Moshe himself was allowed to enter the promised land. Why? Because he himself was a sinner. And this is a picture of our own walk. Um, because we know Yahweh saved us by the blood of the Lamb. Likewise, at Passover, he saved them by the blood of the Lamb. And he led them through the Red Sea, and there's a New Testament scripture that says that they were baptized into Moshe, or Moses, in the sea and in the cloud. So there's the water, baptism, and the baptism of the Spirit. And then when they, when they got to the other side, the sea fell on, and the old men who were of the enemy died, right? The men of Egypt died. And in that is a picture of our own baptism. The old man that was Yahweh's enemy, perishes in the water, and a new man, Yahshua the Messiah, rises up through us. Now, he brought them through this wilderness land, this land that was not their own, and he taught them his Torah, his law. He taught them the way of righteousness. However, Moshe, who taught them the law, was not able to bring them across to Jordan. And in that is a picture of us, we are strangers and sojourners, and we cannot rely upon Moses and the law to lead us across to Jordan. While the name Joshua in the Hebrew, he was the one that actually led them across to Jordan, the name Joshua in the Hebrew actually is pronounced Yahshua or Yahshua in the Hebrew. He, he carries the exact same name as the Messiah. Joshua, or Yahshua, is the same name. Joshua is just another way of saying Yahshua. Because there's no J in Hebrew. All right. So he led them across the Jordan, right? And what did he do? In this town called its moon, they shouted, and the kingdoms of the world, the, the, first, the first city fell, and that was the sign that Yahshua was going to destroy every enemy. And this was the beginning where he destroyed every enemy. And he brought forth a new nation. And 
Likewise, Yahshua, we need to rely upon him, not, not Moses. Moses can't take us there. We need a man named Yahshua to take us across the Jordan and into the, the promised land. And, you know, this is one of the many things that amaze me about the scriptures. Um, but the seventh month, this Feast of Trumpets, we see in the New Testament talks about Messiah coming at the last trump. This is all a picture of what the children of Israel went through. Because, remember, the Feast of Trumpets takes place on the seventh moon, right? The seventh time children of Israel went around this city called its moon, the seventh time around it, they shouted and they blew the trumpets. And the city came down and the kingdoms of, this, of that world became the kingdoms of Yahweh. And so, likewise, with the shout of an archangel and the trumpet of Elohim, the Messiah will return, and the earthly, temporary, shaky, wobbly foundations and walls and kingdoms of this world that people have relied upon for their protection will come tumbling down, and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our master Yahweh and of his Messiah, Yahshua, as the scriptures say. Revelation 11:15. Then the seventh angel shout, sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our master and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. And all the things that we think are important in this age will suddenly mean nothing. Now, an interesting thing about the Feast of Trumpets is that it occurs on the first day of the month. Now, if we understand Yahweh's calendar is not based on human calculation and the thing that Roman Romans invented, Julius Caesar, a demon-worshipping emperor of Rome invented, that we have today hanging on most walls of homes, and the hit Yahweh's calendar and his feast days are based upon the motion of the heavenly bodies. We'll discover that we actually have something to be watching for on the night that's called, or the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then Elohim made two great lights, the lesser light to rule the day, or the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Now, let them be for signs and seasons and for days and for years. And look at this word right here. It's translated seasons. In the Hebrew, it's the Hebrew word moed. Moedim. This word is it means appointed times. And it's actually translated feast 23 times in the King James Version. And so... Yahweh established his lights in the heavens to be for the feast days. Even back then, they, these lights were created for the purposes of feast days, for his appointed times. He has appointed times that he wants us to follow. Of course, one appointed time is the Sabbath. There are seven other appointed times in Scripture that are holy days or holidays. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse Two, it says, Therefore all the men of Israel assembled King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. This would have been the seventh month feast. Now this word month, actually in the Hebrew, it means moon. That's what the word means. In the moon of Ethanim, which is in which is the seventh month. And this word month here is is from a different word meaning renewal or new moon. So in the moon of Ethanim, which is the seventh new moon, or seventh month, that's when they gathered. So the months are actually determined by the cycle of the moon. The seventh cycle of the moon in a given year is the month of Ethanim. Ethanim means to endure with strength. 
And it's the seventh moon that we're all waiting on, really. Spiritually, we're waiting on that seventh moon. You see, Yahweh has not yet had Messiah fulfill everything the feast days represent. In bondage, he revealed himself. He said, when we were in bondage, he revealed himself. He set us, set us free. He saved us from the blood of the Lamb. Let us into the wilderness where we are now. He gives us his Torah. That was at Pentecost. He gave the Torah. So there's two feasts. The feast of, of unleavened bread and Passover. And then we have Pentecost or Shavuot or Feast of Weeks. That's also when Messiah died. Messiah died at the exact hour they were sacrificing Passover lambs in Jerusalem, causing us to be unleavened, feast of unleavened bread, and then poured out his spirit on the day in which he also gave his law. So he gave the law at Pentecost and gave us the spirit, which brings us forgiveness of sin for having broken the law and leads us to keeping his commandments and places that law right here in our hearts. And now, what are we waiting on? We're, we're in the wilderness. We're waiting on Yahshua's return. And there's this vast length of time between the third month and the seventh month. There's a four-month time period, approximately, a little less than four months, that we are waiting now for Feast of Trumpets to be fulfilled. And we are watching, we're waiting, we're longing for that return. And he will return at the last trump. He will return when the trumpet sounds. And we have, so we have this feast of trumpets. And so we, for this month of Ethanim, we must endure with strength to come to this month of Ethanim. To be found faithful when the Messiah returns. And so tomorrow night is going to begin the sixth month. And if you look up in the sky, just after sundown, within an hour or so after sundown, you will see the reappearance of the moon. It would have been in, in conjunction. It's close to conjunction right now. That means the, the moon was recently in line with the sun, and so the moon actually rose and set with the sun. But then, eventually, it's going to move in its orbit and the sun will go down first, and then the moon will go down afterward. And so the sun will go down within 30 minutes or so after sundown. And for those of you who are in far south Texas, I mean close to Mexican border, and those of you south of there, it's a possibility you could see this actually tonight. There's a slim chance. have to have very good atmospheric conditions to see it. But um, certainly tomorrow night. You're going to see this thin crescent-shaped moon just to the left of where the sun had set. So look to the left of where the sun set. That's where you're going to be looking for the new moon. And that will mark the beginning of the sixth month of Yahweh's calendar, which means that we are only one month away from the Feast of Trumpets as we stand right now. And so after tomorrow night, uh, some of you in South Texas might see it tonight, begin looking for this um new moon and then one month or 29 and a half days afterward you will see the next new moon which will be the beginning of the feast of trumpets now any shepherd of israel watching over his flock could look up in the sky and know when a new month would begin and uh, on earth it illumination of the moon grows until it reaches its full moon phase and then gradually decreases in light until the moon is no longer visible in the night sky but when we see this moon reappear, after it has been dark, it is a new moon. Now this is different than the scientific new moon that you might see on your wall in the calendar, which is not based on how visible the moon is, but is instead based on the conjunction, which is when the moon is not visible. And so if we went by the visible moon, which appears within an hour or so after sunset in the western sky just to the left of the setting sun that would be the biblical new moon so we have the earth here we have the sun here and then we have the moon going around an orbit around the earth and when the moon is at this position right here between the sun and the earth in its orbit that's the conjunction and then 
eventually the moon will continue its orbit and it'll we'll be able to see just after sundown just the, the light of the sun kind of edging around the side of the moon that's the new moon okay and so but this this is very interesting because it it points to this picture this picture of what Messiah told us to do. he told us to watch 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 he kept saying I tell you watch and that's exactly what we're doing on this night when the Feast of Trumpets begins. We're watching to see whether or not we're going to be able to behold with our eyes this new moon. And so we're watching. We want to know. And so we look for it. And uh, quite often, we don't know if it's going to be that night. We might not know. I mean, it's possible. Now, today we have things called moon charts where, you know, we have a better idea of when it's going to be. So when is this Feast of Trumpets? On the night of September 14th, um, this is a, a graphic of the entire world. And this is a moon chart, which helps you understand where the moon should be visible. Um, you will notice that um, this this green area right in here that is where the new moon will certainly be seen if you live in an area where we have this right here this kind of a lighter green shade you will need to have pretty good atmospheric conditions that means very clear skies to be able to see the new moon not no haze you know you'd have to have really good skies and then if you live up here, you would need a pair of binoculars to even find the moon. And then you might be able to see it after that. And you have to have clear skies as well. But uh, you see here that where I live anywhere in Missouri, it should be uh, easily visible to us. It'll be a little bit low in the night sky, but we should be able to see it. So on this night called September 14th on a Roman the Roman calendar, we have you know probably hanging on most walls of most homes in the United States. Uh, that's when we're going to go out and look for it. Now the people in Israel are unlikely to see it. It's possible, but not likely. But um, I've noticed that um, you know there's this this time where you're not sure. Some of, you, some of you just won't know unless you actually go out and look. And so that adds to the mystique, and it really fits with what Yahushua said, no one knows the day or the hour. And um, so here is the official seventh month of Ethanim on a calendar that you can download and you can print on my website. You can download and print this calendar out. And uh, I want you to notice the calendar, the way I have it set up, I have the Roman times right here in the upper right-hand corner of each day. So on this night of the 14th, um, that's when we're going to be looking for the new moon. And if we see the new moon that night, then that means the new month has begun. And so on the night of September 14th, that's when we're going to look. And since Yahweh's days begin at evening, the day, you know, since it's a half hour or so after sunset, the, the day of trumpets will literally begin before you know it. It will already be the Feast of Trumpets and before you can even look in the sky and know whether it is or whether it isn't. And just like Yahshua, he's coming before you know it. Yahshua is coming before you know it. So it's all amazing depth here and we're talking the last couple of weeks about how awesome Yahweh is and this is one of the reasons why he is so awesome uh, because everything matches up that he does and then so the day of the 15th of the daylight portion of the 15th of September on our own our own way of reckoning time will begin that will be also this feast of trumpets so and then on the day of the 24th and the night before, on the 23rd, we'll begin the Day of Atonement, which we'll be talking about soon. 
and then the 29th and actually going back to the 28th the night before will begin this Feast of Tabernacles. So we're calling everyone to join us on the 28th of September. You can come a day early if you want to and uh, join us for Feast of Tabernacles in Steelville, Missouri. You can read all about it on the front page of Eliad.com. You click the link there and read all about it. But another thing I've noticed is that often and by the way, the last day of the feast is on the 6th, and pretty much everyone will be leaving here on the 7th. There might be some who will stay a day extra. But um, anyway, if you live in, if you go by a Jerusalem sighting, you probably would regard this being the last day. Or if you see it a day later in your locale, then all these days will shift to from the 6th to the 16th to the 25th to the 30th and then the 7th being the day so everything will shift one day forward if you don't see the new moon in your location which in the upper northern part of the United States is quite possible you will not be able to see it and those who live in Israel may not be able to see it either so uh, for us we if we see it we're gonna call it if we see it we're not gonna pretend like it doesn't exist we're gonna call it so Yahweh has his own uh, dateline, I guess you could say. <laughs> it's not necessarily in the middle Pacific, although, you know, it depends on how you do it. But one thing I've noticed is the horizon is still glowing. Sometimes this fiery red in the yes, orange, you know, this like every day, you know. And if you're looking for the new moon, you're going to see this, you know, red color in the horizon. And um, and maybe this is Yahweh's reminder, you know, that, you know, as Yahshua said, he's discerned the face of the sky. Um, but um, if you want to get to the calendar, I forgot to mention this, elia.com slash printed calendar dot html, elia.com slash printed calendar dot html. You can actually go there and download this particular calendar you can print it out hang it on your wall or your refrigerator and uh, and you know if you don't have it already I did have some printed copies of this made available but we pretty much um, gave away you know 800 of them so they're all pretty much gone I got just a few stragglers left over for whoever I think Yahweh is leading me to give it to but um Anyway, you can download this calendar there. So anyway, this this redness in the sky, this fiery orangish kind of a red, is looks like fire. I mean, sometimes it's hard to even tell the difference. If you ever notice, be a fire off in the horizon, someone's fields on fire or something. It's got this same kind of a color to it. Well, you know, she was said. Actually, scripture says Malachi four one says, "Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven." And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says Yahweh of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Now, the stall-fed calves would be, uh, you know, they were always fed the best. You know, the, the calves that were in the stalls, and they didn't ever leave the stalls. They had to be hand fed. And uh, so they were very well fed. So Yahweh's going to take good care of us. And uh, But it says the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And why is he called the Son? Uh, sadly, um, early Christianity kind of picked up this verse and connected the Messiah to the Son and tried to attract the pagans to the faith of Messiah by pointing out this first. But look, Yah, Yah, our Elohim is a consuming fire, right? And the sun is a consuming fire. It's in the sky. It's a consuming fire. And Yahshua is the image of Elohim. And so he is this fire of righteousness. And it's righteousness that cleanses all unrighteousness because righteousness and unrighteousness cannot dwell together. And so 
he's going to be a righteous burn. You know, this burning is going to happen. This, this, this day is burning like an oven. And Messiah, his brightness, he will consume many with the, the his brightness of his coming will just consume people. But those who are righteous will not be affected by the heat and the brightness because we have no unrighteousness in us to that needs to be consumed. And so we will not be unrighteous uh, through the Messiah Yahshua. And therefore, we can look at uh, this and say, this is hope for us. But those who are proud, too proud, too into their own selves, the day is coming and burning like an oven, and uh, look out. So, listen, this feast has not been fulfilled. It's not been fulfilled yet. And there are so many things that, when you dig into the feast, the feast days, that bring out beautiful, amazing, incredible pictures. You know, and wouldn't it be wonderful if the church kept this feast as a yearly testimony to the world that a Savior is coming to rescue us from the hole we're digging ourselves into. And there is hope. There are answers. There is a kingdom coming that we are all invited to. And we, if the people of the churches would just realize, look, this feast has not been fulfilled. It cannot have been fulfilled. Yahshua is coming with the sound of the trumpet. But for some reason in traditional Christianity, uh, dismissed it. Oh, it's Jewish stuff. We don't do that. And so, so I say, let's sound the trumpet. Let's sound the alarm that Messiah is coming. He has feast days he wants us to fulfill. Yahshua is going to return at the last trump, the shout of an archangel. And just as the children of Israel were told to blow trumpets on that day, I wonder how many of them understood exactly what they were doing, but they were just told to do it as a memorial. And really, it's a memorial that not only looks back to what Joshua did for them, but looks forward to what Yahshua, same name, right? Yahshua, son of Nun, Yahshua, the son of Elohim, is going to do for us. And sometimes we just have to be like little children who want to learn and be obedient to our Father and His will, set aside our own traditions, and be willing to do it. And Yahweh expected that of them. He expects that of all of us. And a lot of times when we begin to practice the things that He tells us to practice, we get to learn a lot of the reasons why we're doing it. Now in Scripture, the trumpets were used for advancing the armies for calling the armies together for war. It's for this reason that a trumpet will sound when Yahshua returns. He will go forth with all of his saints, whom he will gather together, and he will destroy the wicked with the breath of his mouth. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4, it says, He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked, Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. So this is a future thing, and we know that when the trumpet sounds and the dead arise, that's an alarm call for one of the most significant events our Heavenly Father has in his awesome plan. And that's when he's going to gather Israel together. Jeremiah 23, 7 says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh. They shall no longer say as Yahweh lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as Yahweh lives who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I had driven them. And they shall dwell in their own land. Well, Galatians chapter 3 teaches us in verse 29 that those who are Messiahs are Abraham's seed. We went over this recently in the five-part study in Galatians. Also, Romans 11 teaches us that we are grafted in to the olive tree. So, Yahweh is going to gather his children together. Revelation 20, we know, says that we will reign with him 
for a thousand years. And look, Isaiah 66 verse 22 says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says Yahweh, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh, Jew and Gentile, everybody, shall come and worship before me, says Yahweh, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. So at that time, we won't need a new moon broadcast. <laughs> Yahweh's going to bring us all, and we're going to worship him together on the new moon and on the Sabbath. And uh, that means we're going to have to, at that time, he's going to teach the world his calendar. His calendar is going to be well known to the whole world. Because one new moon to another, so forget Caesar's calendar. That's what he's going to be saying. When, Yahweh's, when Yahweh comes, Yahshua comes, and we finally reach the point where our prayers answered. Let your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Guess what? Yahweh's will is that the whole planet observes the new moon day as a day of worship and the Sabbath day the whole world and not only the new moon and not only the Sabbath but also Zechariah fourteen sixteen says it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king Yahweh of hosts and to keep the feast of tabernacles all the nations it shall come to shall be whichever families of the earth do not come to Jerusalem to worship the king Yahweh of hosts upon them will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. Egyptians, also keeping the Feast of Tabernacles, they shall receive the plague with which Yahweh strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations, Jew and Gentile alike, that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This scripture has never been fulfilled. Never has been fulfilled. But it will be. Because Yahweh's word is true. You will not often hear these verses quoted in a traditional Christian church. But this is what the kingdom, when we say in the Master's Prayer, we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. This is his will. This is what he wants. This is what he's saying he's going to do. And contrary to what you may have heard in traditional churches, feast days are included, new moons included. And people will be paying attention to Yahweh's calendar in the new moon days, and will be gathering on the Sabbath, and the whole planet will keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now what you're most likely to hear in a traditional church is 1 Corinthians 2, 9, but as, I, as is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which Elohim has prepared for those who love him. Some mystery thing off in the future. Oh, we see through a glass dimly. We don't really know exactly what's going to happen. Wait a minute. You ever read verse 10? But Elohim has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of Elohim. It is the Spirit of Yahweh that inspired the words in Isaiah 66 and Zechariah 14. And all we got to do is read them. And Yahweh reveals to us the things that he's going to do. So what will this kingdom be like? It'll be a kingdom that we're supposed to be proclaiming right now, right? says that we're supposed to proclaim the kingdom, repent the kingdom of Elohim's at hand, and yet how many people really bother to look and see what that's going to be like? Um, 
So the scriptures I quoted to you, they are going to happen. They are unfulfilled prophecies. They speak of a time when Yahshua will, for 1,000 years, rule over the whole planet. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 says, I saw thrones and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls who had been beheaded for their witness to Yahshua and for the word of Elohim. Two things, faith in Yahshua and the keeping of commandments. Who had not worshipped the beast or his image, who had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Look for it. It's going to happen. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of Elohim and of the Messiah, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So Yahshua, he came to proclaim a kingdom, and when he returns, that kingdom is going to be established. He's not coming to establish the old covenant. He's not. He's coming to establish the new covenant. And the new covenant includes feast days. It does. We see it. Matthew 4.17 says, From that time Yahshua began to preach and say, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's the kingdom about? Does anybody know? I asked this question to our generation. Does anybody know? Matthew 4, 23, Yahshua went about to all Galilee, teaching their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness, all kinds of disease among the people. Many times he would tell people in parables, the kingdom of Elohim is like this. And who would be worthy of entering that kingdom? Over 50 times in the book of Matthew alone, we read where Yahshua will be talking about the kingdom. These were additional things besides what was already written about this kingdom, this coming kingdom, and the prophets. These are additional things he's bringing, bringing to light. Who's worthy to enter? Who's not? And so on. And of course, we know when he taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. And when that happens, hallelujah. I like this prayer, actually, so much. We, first of all, we declare the holiness of his name, right? And then his kingdom. And then we ask for what we need. I like that. Acts 8.12, when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of Elohim in the name of Yahshua Messiah. Kingdom, name, kind of connected, just like this prayer. Name, kingdom, connected together. Both men and women were, were baptized. Acts 19, 8, And when he went to the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of Elohim. This was normal. I'm talking about the kingdom all the time. Acts 28 to 30, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own in house, received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of Elohim. This is what they're doing. Are we doing it? And teaching the things which concern the Master Yahshua Messiah with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So what we're reading is the kingdom we're supposed to be proclaiming. This is Yahweh's will being done on the earth as it is in heaven. And these are the things that we think about when we say, your kingdom come. It's not the only thing. But it says his name will be one. The Sabbath will be observed. The new moons will be remembered. The feast days will be kept. How can we say they're done away with? Doesn't make any sense. How can it be done away with? The problem isn't they're done away with. The problem is we misunderstand the New Testament scriptures, if that's what we believe, because there they are. So when Yahshua comes back, no more elections. Thank Yahweh for that. No more turmoil, no more bombs. No more suicide bombers, no more terrorists. Just a righteous king, bringing the justice to this earth that is so sorely needed.
Yahshua says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. Messiah doesn't even know. Only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray. For you do not know when the time is. We don't know. Not even Yahshua knew. He just says, if I don't know, trust me, you don't know. You don't know when the time is. So, in fact, if you think you know, let's suppose you thought you knew it was two weeks from now. And suppose it really was two weeks from now, which I don't think is possible. But suppose it was. If you died tomorrow, kingdom already come for you. I mean, you can't go, oh, it'll be next. What's it going to matter? When we go in the grave, that's it. You you walk out in the street, you get hit by a Mack truck. Next thing you see is Yahshua, and you're standing before him in judgment. I mean, that's, to you, it'll be instant. You're not going to go, well, here I am in the grave waiting. It does not work that way. You, somebody coming the other direction in a car turns your steering wheel six inches. Smack. There's no, no guarantee for tomorrow. Next thing you know, you're standing before Elohim. There's no guarantee. And so Yahshua tells us, watch and pray. You don't know. You don't know when the time is. Matthew 13, 34, he says, It's like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all. Watch. Watch. That's exactly what we're doing the night of the Feast of Trumpets. We're watching. The Feast of Trumpets is a feast that gives us a picture of the time when Yahshua will come back and gather us all together with the sound of a trumpet. How fitting. We don't know, really, for sure, whether we're going to see it in many locations. And so this feast gives us a, a yearly reminder of the need to be ready, be prepared, be watching for the coming of the Son of Man, because no one knows the day or the hour he will return. He will return as a thief in the night, and at the sound of a trumpet, when all those who are in the graves will hear his voice, the shout of an archangel, and so we will come and we'll feast with him. He will cleanse us of all our sins, the corruption will put on incorruption, and we will dwell with him forever. But what is Yahshua saying here when he says watch? What are we watching for? Is he saying we're not allowed to sleep at night? I mean, we all need our, our rest, right? What's he mean watch? Does he say watch TV? <laughs> no. Let's keep our eyes focused on the heavenly things. That's what it is. Signs of our Savior's return so that we are not deceived when the imposter comes along and tries to deceive the whole world. If our eyes are on the heavenly things, if we're, if our, where our eyes are focused is where our minds are focused. They even say when you drive a car and, a, and there's a car coming the other direction, it's at night, don't look at their headlights. Because you just have this automatic tendency to drive toward whatever, this, whatever you're looking at. And so they recommend that when a car is coming the other direction at night, especially if they have their brights on, look at the right side of the road, the edge of the road, instead. So you don't lose your place. So where we look, where our eyes are, is often where our hearts are yearning toward. And so let's keep our eyes focused on the heavenly things, signs of our Savior's return, so that we are not deceived when the imposter comes. Yahshua said in Luke 21, 33, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. 
for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth, of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Do we watch and do we pray always that we would be counted worthy to escape the things which are coming to pass upon the and stand before the Son of Man? Are we doing that? That's an important question that Yom Teruah, every year, this Feast of Trumpets, is going to bring to our remembrance. Carousing cares of this life, weighing our hearts down. Yahshua warned us so many times not to get caught up in earthly things. It's the earthly walls and kingdoms that will be destroyed. Just as Yahshua, son of Nun, came and leveled Jericho, Yahshua the Messiah will put an end to the kingdoms and foundations and defenses that this world has and all its temporary glory. And so, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to keep our focus on Yahweh and heavenly things during times of plenty, times of wealth, times of trouble and times of difficulty and trial and that hit us like a Mack truck. Oh, and then people humble themselves and seek Yahweh. That's when they do it. And some people are content to using Yahweh like a spare tire. He's back there in a the trunk in case he needs him. They need him, but uh, otherwise they pretty much forget about him. We can't use Yahweh like a spare tire. He's looking for people who will watch and focus on the spiritual things during times of plenty. Those who will bless him for the goodness that they are experiencing and remember him, that he is the author of all that is good. So are we praying that we're counted worthy to escape the great trials that will come as a snare upon the whole earth? We must endure. We must persevere. We must ethanim, seventh month, right? Revelation 3.10 says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one may take away, may take your crown. This is Yahshua's words to the assembly in Philadelphia, who did not deny his name. And they had good works. It's the only assembly that he had little to say negatively about. And so we need to be this Philadelphian assembly, the Philadelphia city of brotherly love, right? And so we need to walk in love during this time. The question is whether we are willing to walk in love. and willing to do so and serve others and bless others during this time of plenty. Matthew 24, 45-48 Yahshua asked this question, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master when he comes will find so doing. Doing what? Giving out food. What are we talking about? Giving out food. Spiritual food. The word of Elohim. And of course, physical provisions as well. Physical and spiritual provision. Scripture refers to spiritual food being Yahweh's word. If you do any studying at all. But look what he goes on to say. Actually, go back in uh, verse 31. He says, or four, I should say, to verse 31, chapter 25. He says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. 
Then the king will say to those at his right hand, on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food, physically and spiritually. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. It's a spirit, physically, spiritually. I was a stranger, and you took me in, physically and spiritually. I was naked, and you clothed me, physically and spiritually. And spiritually, I was sick and you visited me, spiritually and physically. I was in prison and you came to me. There's spiritual counterparts to each of these. And that's probably even more important than the physical. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Master, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When do we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick or in prison and, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to least one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. To me. So when you see someone out there who is in these various conditions, think of that person being Yahshua himself. Would you just pretend like you didn't see it? Would you ignore it then? Would you care then if it was Yahshua? Then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirst, gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will answer him, saying, Master, when did you see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So, Peter says, Be watchful. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. looks like to me sheep are focused on the heavenly things they're spending their time ministering serving others like Yahshua did they paid attention to the needs of others they chose to love the others the self-centered lifestyle was not among the sheep the goats on the other hand paid no attention to the needs around them and mostly focused on themselves and their own interests Maybe it wasn't what the goats did that condemned them. It's what they didn't do. They buried their talent in the sand, focused on the cares of this life, and laid their foundations in things that have no eternal value whatsoever. They had no retirement program. Maybe even they, like those in Amos, Isaiah, you read about these people, they maybe even keep feast days, but paid no attention to the oppressed, the poor, the fatherless, the widow, and didn't seek to bring them to justice, the ones who were not being treated pr properly, never bothered to provide what they needed. There were a lot of other people to do it, and then blamed the leaders for failing to take care of things. Brothers, sisters, it's not the world's responsibility to take care of the poor and help bring justice to the world, it's ours. We as believers have a whole lot more to offer the downtrodden because, you know, when the government feeds somebody, and after that they don't do anything else. But we can give them what they need spiritually. And that's far more important because if they die because of no, they have no food physically, you could, they could still enter into kingdom if they're rich spiritually. But if they, die, if they live physically and do not have a life spiritually, they really don't have anything yet. You know, we can not only visit those in a physical prison, we also can, those who are in spiritual prison, free their hearts from what Satan has bound them. We can not only provide shelter for the one in need, we can give them eternal habitations in the house of our Elohim. 
We can not only offer them a drink of water, we can lead them to the one who will provide a fountain of living water that they can drink from and never thirst again. We can not only offer clothing to the poor, we can offer to them the robe of righteousness that Yahshua wants to adorn them with. We are the ones who should be taking the lead in these areas. And if we think that keeping a feast is good enough, we need to take a lesson from Scripture. We need to be about our Father's business and be aware of the traps. The point of the feasts is to draw our attention to the spiritual. And beware of the traps, pits, and snares of the world because if the enemy can only divert our attention from the things that are important, he's already winning the war. He's already winning the battle because he's diverted our attention from the heavenly things. And we're not watching and we're not praying, even though the end of all things is at hand. First Peter 4, 7. And scripture says, therefore, be serious. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. Every one of these things that the sheep were doing, they cared. They were expressing love. That's what they were doing. They were expressing love. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of Elohim. That's what it means to be a good steward. Walk in love. Scripture says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. So we're called to watch. Some of you are maybe wondering, Tom, I thought you were going to talk about Yom Teruah today. I did. I am. This is what Yom Teruah is really about. Watching. Being prepared for the Messiah. It's not just Hebrew this and Hebrew that. It's what this is all about. It's not about practicing Judaism. It's about using these feast days to call our attention to the things that Yahweh wants to, start to get our attention with. And we're called to be watching. Look, if it would be that Yahshua does not return in our generation, you didn't waste your time watching. All you got to do, read the obituaries. Realize our time on this earth is short. There is no guarantee of tomorrow. Young people die. Middle aged, Old people die. All it takes is an aneurysm in our brain, and that's it. We're done. And then the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those that have done good, to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil, to the resurrection of condemnation. So let's not assume it's just the coming of Messiah that ends our life. Our lives are fragile, and we need to seek the heavenly things. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. When we realize how short our time is, we begin to look for wisdom. We begin to seek it and apply our heart to it. Psalm 39 verse 4 says, Yahweh, make me to know my end. And what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am? Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man in his best state is but vapor. Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches, and does not know who will gather them. And now, Yahweh, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. That's what we need to be like. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. James 4.14 So let's be ready to endure. 
the things to come. Let's cleave to Yahweh our strength. Let's be ready to rule and reign with Messiah for a thousand years where the Torah will be the law of the land and Yahweh will be the king, not the modern politicians, Yahweh. You know, in Israel of old, of old, another reason for the blowing of the trumpet was to announce a new king. First Kings chapter 1, verse 34 says, Therefore let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel and blow the horn and say, Long live King Solomon. They're blowing the trumpets to announce the new king. Then you shall come up before him, after him and he shall come and sit on my throne. He shall be king in my place, for I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. So when this last trumpet sounds, the world is going to be under a rule that it has never known or seen before. Unless they're believers. We already have his, he's already our king. But the ruler and the king of this world will be dethroned. And Yahshua will sit on the throne. And he will be the king that we all submit to, that we all seek. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the Elohim of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law will go forth, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. So the law will still be there. It will not have been abolished. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords in the plowshares and their spears in the pruning hooks. The nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. This has never happened. It's going to happen. But everyone shall live, sit under his vine, under his fig tree, and no one shall make them ashamed, afraid, for the mouth of Yahweh of hosts has spoken. For all people walk, each in the name of his Elohim, but we will walk in the name of Yahweh, our Elohim, forever and ever. In that day I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast, and those whom I am afflicted. He's going to gather them together. Gather them together. And all of a sudden, the name will mean something. Yahweh's name will mean something in that day. I say, why not? Why not let His law and His His Messiah and His feast days and His new moons and the Sabbath? Why? Why, why not make that mean something now? That's my question for this generation. When He gathers the outcasts, we have we have to be willing to be outcast. We have to be willing to be afflicted and be among those who are looked down upon and thought to be nothing by the world. Brothers and sisters, we better be ready when the trumpet sounds because guess what? Babylon is going down. Let's not get caught up in her ways. Let's instead seek to be caught up in the air with Yahshua when he returns. And take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and cares of this life that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who are on the face of the earth. First Thessalonians 5, 2 says, For you know yourselves, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of Yahweh comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. They shall not escape. But you, brethren, you, brethren, it's going to be different, he says, for us, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you like a thief. You are all sons of light, and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. 
To sleep means to not really be aware of what's going on, your surroundings, because you're not paying attention to what's really going on. If you're not looking to the heavenly things, you don't really know what's going on. All you're looking at is, oh, that happened, that happened, that happened on the earth, and not seeing the spiritual. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us, be, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For Elohim did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Master Yahshua Messiah, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So what does the Feast of Trumpets have to teach us? It's a yearly reminder of the Messiah's return. It's a yearly reminder of our need to prepare ourselves and be sanctified, that we might be ready to meet the King and reign with Him. It's a yearly reminder that we are the army of Yahweh who is being called forth to war, being fully ready to endure any hardship necessary to defeat the enemy. Ethanim. Are you ready to endure hardship as a good soldier of Yahshua the Messiah? 2 Timothy 2.3 No one entangled in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Well, the Feast of Trumpets is a yearly reminder that we need to not be entangling ourselves too much with the affairs of this life because we want to please the one who enlisted us as a soldier. We need to report for duty every day. Reporting for duty, sir. Re re reporting for duty, Abba Yahweh. And so let's put down our toys and the worldly pursuits and pick up the armor of Yahweh and go forth to battle. The Feast of Trumpets is a yearly reminder of the futility of worldly politics and the empty promises that they bring. It's a yearly reminder of the promises that we have in Messiah are far greater than any promises coming from a politician. Only Yahweh has the answers. We're not a part of democracy or republic. Donald Trump and Barack Obama and whoever else is out there, they're limited in their power to do good or to do evil. Yahweh is actually the one who's king to whom we must all give account. And so the Feast of Trump, it's, reminds us there is a greater government in place, right? That will one day put an end to all these governments. I thought this man, Donald Trump, he's pointing out some things. China is going to take us over one of these days. This is judgment. This is judgment. This nation, the United States of America, is under judgment. The enemies are getting stronger, and we are getting weaker as a nation. But my nation, it is not so. My nation is a nation of Israel, not the one that's over there right now in the Middle East, but the heavenly nation of Israel. I am a peculiar people, a holy nation, a heavenly priesthood. And I have a greater government that I am currently seeking to follow that will put an end to all of these governments. And we need to see ourselves as ambassadors of his government rather than putting our hopes in the next politician. The Feast of Trumpets is a yearly reminder that we must be watchful and guard our hearts and minds against anything the enemy may seek to do to our hearts in our deeds. And for us men, we watch over our households. And for the elders of our people, be watchful over the flock, as the Good Shepherd would have you do, warn against the wolves. If you call yourself an elder, you're accountable to this. Don't forget that. The Feast of Trumpets is a yearly reminder that we must be about our Father's business and give food to those who are in need, spiritual food that we may be we would be blessed when our master comes if he would find ourselves so doing 
And so, my brothers and sisters, let's be ready to hear the sound of the trumpet. Let's be ready to hear that shout of the archangel, that midnight cry to meet the bridegroom. Having our lamps filled with oil, our hearts filled with the service of love, being filled with Yahweh's spirit of love, joy, peace, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control, faith. Let's be ready to meet the bridegroom and join him in the ultimate feast that will never end. Let's be ready. Let's prepare ourselves. Let's be ready when the last trumpet sounds. And so, my brothers and sisters, as we prepare ourselves, for the coming of the bridegroom. May Yahweh bless you, and may Yahweh truly have mercy on us all.